I'm Dwayne Ford. Joe Tilly Sports is coming up. Our guest this week, Sandy Holly, without dispute, the greatest jockey this country has ever produced. And Jason Portwondo, one of the finest racing analysts in the country. We're going to preview the Breeders' Cup. Joe Tilly Sports, coming up. And once again, we have two outstanding guests for you here today. He was born in Oshawa, began riding at 17, 6,450 career wins, $88.5 million in purses. He was top rider in North America four times. He was the first jockey to win 500 races in one year. Four-time winner of the Queen's Plate, eight-time winner of the Woodbine Oaks, Eclipse Award winner, two-time winner of the Lou Marsh Award as Canada's top athlete, a member of the U.S. Horse Racing Hall of Fame, the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame, the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame, a member of the Order of Canada, Sandy Hawley. And he graduated from Seneca College in 1996, sports reporter for 680 News. We became a sports anchor at The Score, Sportsnet, trackside reporter for TSN and CTV, co-host of Talking Horses, a sovereign award-winning show. Great show at that. Canadian correspondent for TVG, host, racing analyst for the Woodbine Entertainment Group today, Jason Portwondo, ladies and gentlemen. Guys, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you great very much, see you. Great to see both of you. <laughs> so you we've too, got the 38th, the 38th running of the Breeders' Cup. It's like the Super Bowl of horse racing. It's everything you want to see in horse racing. It's every kind of race you can imagine. It's November 5th and 6th at Del Mar Racetrack, uh, where the surf meets the turf, right next to Torrey Pines. Sunny and 72. It's going to be both days. You can't ask for better, better weather. Uh, should they not have it there every year, you guys? What do you think? Uh, that'd be okay with me. I'll tell you, every time I rode at Del Mar, the weather was always perfect. And I've heard that in the world, it's probably the best temperate weather. Uh, year round, it uh, hardly ever gets below 60, hardly ever gets above 80. It's going to be perfect weather, weather for the Breeders' Cup as well. What do you think about that, Jay? You like yeah. the perfect weather thing? Uh, oh, man. You know what? And quickly, when I step aside here, I just got to plug in my computer so it doesn't lose the battery power. But yeah, you know what? I always seem to get the cold weather assignments, right? We we, we got the uh, Super Bowl. Oh, great. Where is it this year? Soldier Field in Chicago, where it's going to be minus 30. <laughs> Uh, Anyways, yeah. No, good luck. No, Del Mar is beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, listen, I, I know, but a lot of people are going to say, yeah, you got to complain because you're going to the Super Bowl. Come on, buddy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so let me just plug it quickly. Let me just plug it quickly. Okay, no problem. So, yeah, 14 races over two days, $31 million. And, of course, with the, the main race, the Breeders' Cup Classic, uh, Larry Colmas is going to call the action. Uh, Trevor Denman was going to, but he has a herniated disc. Uh, of the returning winners, there's uh, Nixco, Essential Quality, Tarnawa, Adaria, uh, Order of Australia, Gamine, Glass Slippers, and Golden Pal. Sandy, let's talk about Del Mar. Uh, you raced there for a number of years. You had 17 stakes races there. Uh, tell us about you, some of your fond memories from the track and what it takes to win at Del Mar. Well, you know what? I, I love riding at Del Mar. Uh, of course, Bing Crosby owned it at one time. Every time you come on the racetrack, uh, he, he sings a song for the first race where the surf meets the turf down at Old Del Mar. Um, I, I loved it there. I loved it there. You know, you could actually, if you're sitting in the grandstand, you can see the ocean from the grandstand. It's just a beautiful setting. Uh, the surface to ride over, it was an excellent surface to ride over. The, the dirt track was always in tremendous shape. Uh, the only thing I could say for the Europeans is maybe that short stretch down the, down the stretch uh, on the turf. Uh, the turf is a little bit shorter stretch. A lot of times you have to make your move on the turn, and you'll see them bunching up at the head of the stretch a little bit, Joe. That it could be a factor for those Europeans who aren't used to that uh, tight, those tight, that tight final turn on the yep. turf. Well, it definitely could, and and like I say, sometimes 
you make your move down the backstretch coming into the final turn. And <laughs> I remember so many times, so many times getting in trouble on that turn, trying to make my move, trying to find a spot to go. And most of the time you had to wheel out to the outside. So it's going to be interesting because I, I know a lot of the European riders, they don't like to lose very much ground. So they try and stay down on the inside. So it's going to be pretty interesting. That's for sure. Well, you're talking about, you, know, you won the Bing Crosby stakes uh, twice, 79 and 80. Uh, big race there at Del Mar. Um, you had you man, you rubbed, got a chance to rub shoulders with a, a, a lot of celebrities down there. What was that like, uh, Sandy? Who were well, some of the you know, you it, it was pretty cool. Um, probably one of my best friends uh, ended up being Mr. Dick Van Patten. I used to play a lot of tennis with him. Uh, of course, from Get Smart, Don Adams. He was quite a character. He's always fun to be uh -huh. around. Uh, and every once uh -huh. in a while, you see Vince Van Patten with uh, Farrah Fawcett out at the races. So that was pretty cool as well. So when he gave you a tip, did he say, sorry about that, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, I, I think he was as funny uh, off stage as he was on stage. He, he, was, he was quite a character. Right. Well, Jason, I know you've got a chance to rub, some, uh, rub shoulders with some, some cool celebrities over the year. Tell us uh, about some of that, your experiences. Mainly athletes, Joe, because obviously you and I broadcast industry, uh, but quite often because there are normal people too, right? Uh, the stars do show up at sporting events. So a couple of cool ones I've met. Morris Chestnut was pretty cool. Uh, Jamie Foxx as well. I'm still waiting for that chance meeting with Salma Hayek. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but I'm not giving up on that dream. So that would be the ultimate. If I meet Salma Hayek, I don't care after that. I don't have to see another star ever. And I'd be just fine with that. Well, hopefully she takes up the business of horse racing and, and gets a horse or two. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it'll be a natural progression there. Okay. So, um, the, uh, uh, you, in addition to meeting uh, you know, Bing Crosby and the Bing Crosby stakes and, and, and all the other guys, I, I, funny, we had Jim Thompson on the show a couple of weeks ago with Sandy and he talked about, uh, meeting those celebrities, but he also talked about, about meeting you. Uh, when he was uh, <laughs> playing for the Kings in 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 in, in Los Angeles, so let's let's roll that. Uh, um, we uh, would that we would you know like everybody would like you know I got pictures in my office, you know from Tom Cruise to Pe President Reagan, John Candy, all these people come into our room after the game, and uh, it was so cool to you know my first picture was Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell when they're shooting the oh. movie uh, Tango and Cash. Right, so you know, just awesome, awesome to memories to remember that. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty cool. I mean, Sandy Holly has some great memories from back there as well, playing golf with Bob. Penalty Holt. box. You know, he was to, working. Yeah. He was working at penalty. Yeah, he must have seen a lot of uh, a lot of Sandy <laughs> back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, small world. My my uncle Jim Regan was a was a horse owner, right? So he, no, Sandy used to ride his horses. So my uncle always says, if you see Sandy, so I get in the penalty box and he's like, come on. So we're in the penalty box having this whole conversation about horse racing. So yeah, really cool. So that was pretty cool, Sandy. For those who don't know the, the story, you used to work the penalty box uh, for LA Kings games because you're a big hockey fan, you know, coming from Canada, going down there and being in the penalty box. Uh, what, was, what was that like? For you, you know what? It it was awesome to get meet guys like Jim Thompson, and I think I had him in the penalty box as much as I had Marty McSorley in the penalty box. But uh, a lot of times I work in the opposition penalty box as well, so I get to uh, meet a lot of the players from out of town. And I remember Paul Coffey one time came in in my penalty box, and he, he said, "Oh, the boys over there said uh, you're Sandy Holly," and I I said, "Yeah, yeah, Paul, I am," <laughs> and. Uh, he took his glove off and he said, oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I go, pleasure to meet me. I said, it's an honor to meet you. So <laughs> it was just tremendous to have an opportunity to meet some of those guys. Yeah, what a, what a cool thing. It's, it's just, I, I, just a funny little quirky thing I, I had to throw in there because we just happened to be talking about you a couple of weeks ago. So oh, but let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk. Yeah, that's good. Eh? Nice, nice surprise. Let's talk about some racing. Okay, so we got the Future Stars Friday. Uh, the $1 million juvenile turf sprint, five furlongs, one timer trained by uh, Larry Ravelli. Actually, won a race here at, at Woodbine, uh, the Victoria Stakes, uh, ET uh, Bear to Board, five and a half furlongs. Jason, uh, tell us about that race. And, and you were, you're, I'm sure you were there for that. And uh, uh, he romped to an easy win, sent off a three to five. 
Yeah, he's very, very quick. Everybody knew going in he was the one to beat. Actually didn't have the lead there for a bit, as you saw. And now he scampers up the inside with E.T. Baird. And yeah, this guy, I mean, it's hard to argue his perfection, Joe. I don't know if he's good enough to do it again and remain perfect going four for four. But, you know, regardless of the sport, speed is something you can't teach. You can't defend. You got to respect it. And with this guy, he can bring it early. Now, the problem is, obviously, in a five furlong race, there's going to be other speed. And I don't know. I don't know. This was impressive beating 24 Mamba as well as uh, Concealed Carry. But I think he's going to be in a little bit tough on uh, Friday. So I'm actually trying to beat the horse. But who knows? Maybe it's a mistake on my part. I do respect the connections. But uh, I don't know. He might be vulnerable. We're going to find out. What do you think, Sandy? Well, one timer. I think that's a hockey term too, isn't it? One timer. Oh yeah. Yeah, you had so, a good one. Yep. You had a good one timer, didn't you, Sandy? Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> at one time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you played goal, didn't you, Joe? Or no, you're a boxer. You're a boxer. I, mean, no, I was yeah. boxer. I played yeah. hockey too, but I play. I played on the wing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I took a few one timers, but uh, most of the time I missed the puck like I do the golf ball. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's gonna it's gonna be a fantastic race. Uh, you know, I love seeing those sprints. Uh, you know, even horses that come from flying off the pace, it's uh, it's pretty cool to see. Right. Yeah, and, and, and the other horses. Show, are, sorry. Cool. Yeah. I'm yeah. just gonna say quickly. Um, I like a long shot in this race. Go Bears, go! Fifteen to one on the morning line. John Velasquez is going to ride this uh, Euro Invader. Love the blinkers going on for the first time. Kind of feel like this horse needs something to put him over the top. Blinkers could could do exactly that. I mean, this is a two year old Sandy, as you know. They're like young kids. Hard to predict as it is. Never mind on the biggest stage in the world. So I'm going to take a price. Go Bears, go! Yeah, sounds like a Chicago Bears fan named that one, but. Uh... Yeah, it, yeah, it's going to yeah. be an exciting, that's for sure. The sprints are always fantastic. Right, an interesting thing about Gore, an Irish bred, right? He won the great two, uh, the group yep. two Norfolk uh, stakes at Royal Ascot. Um, uh, other horses you might want to look at are uh, another European horse, the group three Mark Molocom stakes was uh, Armour. Um, Twilight Gleaming and Avery, or sorry, Aberly Jane, uh, both unbeaten, both trained by Wesley Ward. So there's uh, other horses to consider in that, in that race uh but like you said when you're talking about juveniles you know why not go with a price because quite often you get you get those upsets right because we haven't had a chance to see them race a lot and you know they, they improve so much in that in that uh you know that juvenile year right so Lee, uh, yeah, sorry, go sorry ahead. about that Averly jane does think. look really good i i think even some people might single this horse this horse looks so good it's gonna be a great race no question about that. Uh, Two million dollar juvenile fillies, mile and one sixteenth. Uh, Echo Zulu, a perfect three and zero, oh, but she's going to be going uh, two turns for the first time. Uh, any any horses stick up for you that race? Juju's Map, uh, trained by Brad Cox. Brad Cox, man, he's he's uh, on top of his game these days. Uh, coming off a win at this distance too at Keeneland, so uh, uh, Juju's Map, another horse you might want to consider. Yeah, I don't mind Juju. Uh, I think that's probably the direction I'll go, and I haven't made my final decisions yet with these races, but uh, Juju right. looks good. And although we're lacking Canadian content this year, it's not, um, you know, the way it usually is for us, at least a few more horses. I think there's one Canadian bread that's racing over the weekend. We do have some horses, though, Joe, that have won at Woodbine, like a one-timer, or even that same race, right. Dairy Nine won the Woodbine Cares. So at least some horses that have stopped that Woodbine and use one of the races here locally as a stepping stone to get to the Breeders' Cup. Right. Another horse in there that won the Natama, too. I, I, I uh, can't remember what that is. but Okay, so let's move along to the, the uh, $2 million that juvenile, be... mile and one sixteenth. That's the good that? Dolphin horse. That one, uh, something Beauty. Yeah, okay. That's who it is. That one in the yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's Sky Beauty? I can't remember. Something Beauty. Oh, that's something what it is. Beauty. No, sorry. I think it was Pizza Bianca. The Pizza Bianca, Christoph Clement. No, that's 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 Bobby Flayzorus. That one was second. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Yeah, that's Bobby. Okay, Flaysaurus but we, we have some. We have some. We wild we beauty. Have some, uh, I think it's wild beauty. Wild beauty. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know that's the thing about the. Uh, 
is there is there now listen we had we had a couple of years there where, where you know racing took uh you know uh took a couple of steps back here in canada right we had uh when we went from the uh you know the money that came was coming in from the from the uh, slots and racetracks and then we had a couple of years where things has that started has that did that affect the gaming in canada and is it starting to come back yet I wouldn't say it affected it that much. I mean, the purses obviously took a bit of a hit, but, um, you know, just sometimes we have horses that are good enough to get there. And then you got to remember a lot of these horses, like any athlete, right? You, you suffer injuries. I mean, last year we had a, a really nice one in Lady Spice Bear for Roger Atfield that, uh, you know, she was perfect heading to the Breeders' Cup. And uh, you know what? Uh, injury. Uh, suffered a setback and it, it, it happened. So I won't say that's a direct result of the loss of, of the uh, slots money, but it certainly had an effect for sure. Well, you know, another thing about it is when you're talking about horse racing, you're talking about, you know, it, it's kind of like soccer, you know, like our, our men's team is now, I think up to 59th, not too long ago, they were 110th. It's like, uh, yeah. you know, but our, our, of course our women are our, our, our number one, right? So that's a, a gold medalist. <laughs> uh, but you have those, you know, the, the rest of the world plays soccer. The rest of the world has horse racing. There's horses coming in here from all over the world, the very best of the very best. And, and, and every once in a while, you get a great Canadian in there. We've had, you know, Dan Smartly, we've had great Canadians in there. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's hard to get there. It's hard to dominate. And, and uh, you know, and you've got some really stiff competition. Well, there's a, a record, I think, 56 international horses uh, this year, too, Joe. And also uh, a record seven uh, horses from Japan are shipping in for the Breeders' Cup this year. So it really is an international race again. Right. Yeah. Gonna, and and speaking of which, touch on some of them. I was going to say, uh, Yuichi Fukunaga, uh, Japanese rider, 44 years. So, I mean, he's not that he's old, but, you know, you know, sports wise, it's, it's kind of getting up there. Not everybody can be a Mike Smith and ride into their 80s like he is. But, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think he brought up. <laughs> That, uh, you know, this is the world stage. And, you know, Joe, you spoke of Dan Smartly. I think back in the day, Dan Smartly, Chief Bearheart, you know, putting Canadians on the Breeders' Cup map. It's weird not having Samson Farms, you know. We know the dispersal has already started. Uh, they're almost done, maybe another year and a bit of racing it, and that's it. So, yeah, we're kind of transitioning into a new territory here. Who do you see is picking up the slack? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I hope somebody does. I mean, back in the day, there was even King right. Haven. Sandy, you remember that, right? So we did have some prominent Winfield farms, some prominent Canadian bloodlines. But yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And then you you think of down the line other outfits. So somebody hopefully will step up, uh, Canadian wise. I mean, as much as you know, owners are integral because they're the ones paying the bills. We can't forget about the breeders, right? The grassroots level of this racing game. Without the breeders, we have no horses. Without horses, obviously, no sports. So, yeah, somebody will, though. Somebody will. Somebody hopefully will step up and become maybe the new dynasty when it comes to Canadian racing. The uh, the the uh, Samson. Tell us a little bit about you know with Samson dispersing Sandy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with Samson and uh, you know what that farm had. Uh, Mr. Samuel always treated me fantastic. Uh, you know, he, he had that tragic accident, uh, very, very unfortunate, but uh, uh, his stable's always been, been very strong, very powerful. Uh, I did have an opportunity to, to ride Dan Smartly, uh, or also rode Chief Bearheart, and uh, they're, uh, all of his horses were tremendous horses, and it was always a pleasure and honor to ride for Samson Farms, that's for sure. Well, the, uh, we're going to move along here to some more racing uh, and chat here. So the $2 million juvenile, Mountain 116th on the dirt, uh, Jack Christopher, uh, Chad Brown trained, um, morning line favorite. Uh, won, he won a one-mile one race, a very nice victory in the Champagne uh, at Belmont. That was back on October 2nd, so not very long ago. And, uh, you know, this is, tell us uh, what you re recall about this race, but I'll tell you, he had a, he had a buyer number there of 102. So he was, uh, he was racing pretty well for, for a juvenile. <laughs> Anytime a young horse can hit triple digits as my goodness, that's, that's eye popping. And he's the only one in the field, Joe, that has hit a hundred on the radar. This guy's just got some big time cruising speed. Doesn't have to be on the lead. You can pick him up there in the red cap. Now he's cruising into second spot. You can't miss him with the big white face there. And 
He's just special. I know it's a small sample size, just two races, but the two races have been very, very impressive. And he's working like he's ready to make this win streak three straight. I don't like favorites. I've got an allergy to them. I looked at Corniche a little bit for Bob Baffert coming in from the West Coast, uh, post-12 with Mike Smith aboard. But Jack Christopher, to me, I mean, he's just a little too good. And uh, anybody with initials JC, all right with me, right? A little divine intervention. Right? I, I really do feel like this is just something special. Well, this was a race, you know, up until we got into yeah. the stretch. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, Jack Christopher uh, decided it was uh, time to see you later. Um, Corniche, yeah, he has gone two turns. Uh, Bob Baffert trains uh, Corniche. He also has Pinehurst and Barossa in the race. I don't know if they drew in or not, uh, Jason. Did Pinehurst and Barossa did. drive? Yep. Yeah, Barossa yeah. post eight, Pinehurst, Pinehurst post nine. So they both did. And in this but race, they, sir, quickly, Joe, I mean, the horse chasing him, command performance, you know, he is gaining on him. So we're going to have the sibling rivalry right. here because Jose rides the favorite, Jack Christopher, and his brother Erad Ortiz, he's going to be riding command performance. So it could be an Ortiz double. Well, the, uh, exactly. the okay, another, 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 yeah, another, or, yeah, it'll be good, good to see that. The uh, Ortiz double, the uh, rattle and roll. Ken McPeak, uh, McPeak train. Uh, he's got a couple of seconds and thirds. McPeak has. He's got a couple of seconds and thirds to the Breeders' Cup, but he's never had, uh, never had a first. So it, it, he might have a shot there. And we talked about uh, a J Japan horse, Japanese horses earlier, um, Sandy. I know those are they're close to your heart. Uh, uh, with Kuru, uh, Jasper, great, um, dominating ten length win in early October. A Japanese uh, bred horse, Jas uh, Jasper yeah. Great. So there's a horse we might we might want to consider. Uh, uh, one of those uh, Japanese horses that are into into the race this year. Um, any also, thoughts on, oh, on any the, of, Yeah. In the Philly and Mare Turf, there's uh, Loves Only You, and uh, you know she's uh, coming in from Japan, third in the Dubai uh, Shema Classic. Uh, this filly has class. She could be a, a, a tough one as well. Uh, my wife. Uh, Kuru Tochi is sitting across from me here, and she always says, uh, oh, if Sandy picks anything, just scratch it off your list. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, maybe that's tough love, you tough love. Off your list. Yeah, but yeah. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be cheering for her. We'll be cheering for her for sure. Yeah, we, we uh, you, if your pick scratch, but but if you're on the horse, you better take it. <laughs> you're on the horse. You, you, if Sandy's on the Mata, horse, you, you better take Mata it. Like retirement, uh, lot. Kuru would definitely be cheering for that one. She picked that one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when, whenever we have you on the show, yeah, whenever we have you on the show, Sandy, I, I, can't, I, I run into people or the people uh, mentioned to me, he said, you know, there's a lot of times that I, that I should have been on Sandy and I didn't, and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of regrets over that. Yeah. Uh, but, you well, know, had, plus you also talk, you know, I, I was also going to say, you also had, talk about, re, re, yeah, go ahead, sorry, go finish ahead. that thought. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to oh, finish your thought, okay. Path. Or even even come up to me now and say, "Oh, I, I used to bet on you all the time." <laughs> and most of the time, I say, "Well, how much do I owe you?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, if you had to repay but, all uh, that money, that wouldn't be very much fun. But if you got a chance to collect on all the ones the you won, that would be great. That's true. Yeah, but you know, for a guy who won eighty-eight million dollars, you, you did all right. You know, you rode eighty-eight million dollars in winners. That's not too bad. I yeah, can't complain. Awesome. I have I had uh, a number of good agents along the way, and I have to give them a lot of credit. Uh, of course, you guys know of Duke Campbell, who I first started with. Uh, he was the man. He's the one that's uh, most instru instrumental in the success of my career, for sure. Very successful jockeys have very successful agents, that's for sure. Okay, well, let's move on to the, the uh, juvenile Philly turf, one mile. Uh, uh, Pizza Bianca, we talked about earlier, that raced in, in the uh, Green Wind Natama. Uh, had the top uh, has the top buyer number in the field. Uh, Hello, you won a Group Two race in Europe at seven furlongs. California Angel won the Jessamine, which was one of those win in your in, or the Jessamine, uh, one of those win in your in races. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Um, you, you asked me when is the last time I rubbed shoulders with a, a celebrity, Bobby Flay, about a month ago. Him and I uh, were hanging out uh, at Woodbine there, did a quick interview, talked about pizza, Bianca, and it's just very easy, obviously, the, the white pizza, it's he's a cook, right? I said, Bobby, what do you enjoy more, walking into a kitchen or a clubhouse? 
at the racetrack and he was like oh man that's a tough question i've never been asked that before but yeah he is a, a horse racing fan through and through and i'm gonna root for him i don't know if she's good enough to get it done she's gonna have to step up her game joe but it's possible all right like uh sandy uh, speaking of the jocks room uh i like the way that sandy he's kind of a little bit like pat day you know the guys who go in there they have to dr drop weight and sandy's walking around eating the cheeseburgers hey guys how you doing today <laughs> <laughs> or going to sweat box with a fudge skull uh yeah i guess i didn't have a lot of friends when I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. That's awesome. okay so let's move on to the juvenile turf mile on the grass uh albar uh the gelding godolphin stables trained by charlie appleby he captured another another horse a race to woodmine uh captured the summer stakes back in september one mile on the ep taylor turf uh it was a, a seven furlongs uh and uh was that on the was on the, the sorry was on the turf or not it was, yep yeah yeah ep Taylor turf yeah pulled away at the yeah. finish it was sorry it was over a mile pulled away at the finish and uh he went from last to first in that race Frankie the yeah. board. What do, you, what do you remember about that race, Jay? Oh, what I remember is the fact that the horse kind of gave them a jump. You know, a lot of Europeans kind of, you know, they just kind of hesitate. They call it dwelt. So they hesitate a little bit in the starting gate, and then they jump out, which is, like I said, that's just a, a Euro thing that happens, right? But anyways, Albar would pass everybody in the entire field, and it's the way he did it. I mean... Now, what you have to consider is that this is a beautiful, wide, sweeping turn turf course. You're not going to get that at Del Mar. It's configured kind of quirky. Uh, Two-year-olds are going to have to adjust. Post position is going to be key. So you don't have the luxury of, like I said, this big sweeping turf course like you do a woodbine when it gets to Del Mar. They go down, they turn left, they go sideways, they go up and all over the place, right? But Albar, at this point now, Frankie asks him the question. He glides down to the rail. Still on his wrong lead. He switches right there. Once he switches, he's gone. Just runs up the score and runs off the screen. Now the uh, I've got it. I'm starting to think that maybe you know because of those tight turns. When you're looking at those turf races, I, maybe you're right. going to give the uh, North American horses a little more respect than you normally would in, the, in, in, in these in these turf races. Yeah, well, I'll defer to Sandy in terms of a trip, but I mean, Sandy, if it's a, a quirky turf course, I mean, this one's not too bad just because it's just a flat mile. So it's, uh, you know, just the regular goal round. But if it's kind of a quirky turf course, would you rather draw inside or outside? Uh, probably somewhere in the middle, Jason, <laughs> would, would be better. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, right. The outside, yeah, you're, you're going to kind of get uh, hung out a little bit going into that first turn inside you could get squeezed so i used to love exactly. the fly post that was like my favorite post but uh you know I'm, I'm sure the european riders as well will be out there walking the turf course so they're, they're gonna know yeah. how much how much distance they have left once they get to the turn and a lot of times uh, like if you're just off the pace you don't have to make your your move to the head of the stretch and then you're free and clear but uh i'll tell you what if, if frank yatori on a horse uh, I don't think I'd leave him out of my exactors. He is the man when it comes to turf racing. Yeah, well, you, I, agree. Other, I got I got a couple other notes here. Uh, Annapolis, Todd Pletcher won the Pilgrim. Uh, uh, Glowntown, uh, Aiden O'Brien. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not, but uh, O'Brien's won 13 uh, Breeders' Cup races. So, you know, keeping him out of the winner's cycle is tough to do. Uh, McKinnon out of American Pharaoh. That horse is owned by Amer uh, Avalanche defenseman Eric Johnson, Colorado Avalanche defenseman. Yep. Uh, he's un unbeaten on turf, trained by Doug O'Neill. There's the name, McKinnon, right? Mike Charlie. Yeah. Named after McKinnon, the Canadian yeah. hockey player from Nova Scotia, right? Right. Named, Named after McKinnon. his teammate. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I, I like modern games, by the way, Joe, for uh, Charlie Appleby. I'm going to team up with William right. Buick. I think this horse is sensational. And if he can uh, handle the course, I don't know. It seems like regardless if it's got cut to it or doesn't, this guy is just adaptable. So Sandy talked about the draw. He's got post one. Sometimes that can be detrimental, but that's about the only negative I see with modern games. Well, the thing is, if, you can if, he, comes from off, if he comes from off the pace, then he's not going to have really have a problem. You know, just settle into, yeah. uh, you know, into that first turn. Just 
try not to get squeezed or you know if, if you have to check a horse that means a lot so as long as he uh, gets right. a good break um, and doesn't get bothered going into that first turn he should be in good shape okay and also uh, here's a, some Canadian connection here Mark Cassie who trains uh, at Woodbine uh, coinage and Grafton Street a couple of horses to, uh, to consider as well okay so let's move on to Saturday and the big race is on Saturday the big ass fans dirt mile love that name uh life is good won two derby preps in the kelso handicap uh silver state won the oakland handicap and hillendale and metropolitan mile king Zhang, uh one of those horses from japan making his first start out of japan he is a kentucky bred uh four-year-old when uh, three wins and five starts uh and uh those are some of the horses to consider in, in the big ass fans dirt mile Okay, Philly and Mare Sprint, seven furlongs in the dirt. Gamine, this is a horse we like to talk about. Oh. Uh, look, at it's such a small field. Now, did Gamine, did Gamine scare the competition away? I mean, the defending uh, champ, nine wins in 10 career two races. Bob Baffert uh, training. Uh, Gamine looks like a horse that that is just about unstoppable. Most recently, she captured the Kettle One Ballerina at Saratoga. That was in late August, yep. over seven furlongs. We got some of that race right here. Uh, Gimme went off at one to five in this race. And I'm thinking that, you know, when you see a small field, I think it's seven. And you look at a horse like Gimme, who had a 104 buyer, by the way, Johnny Velasquez. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, uh, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well... I think the only way they can beat her is if they lock her up inside her stall on the backstretch and don't let her out because <laughs> she's just way too good. She's just way too good, Joe. I mean, she's won nine of ten. She dares the devil. You know, that could be a, a trivial pursuit question, if you will. And I'm sure that uh, Mr. Abbott appreciates that reference, uh, the founder of that yeah. game. Uh, she's the only one to beat this horse. And, and Gamine, she, just, she is just a freak on four legs. She's working lights out again. Baffert, Velasquez, Hall of Fame connections. Yeah, uh, this would be the shock of all shocks if she doesn't win. Sandy, your thoughts on Gamin? Well, I, I think you're right, Joe. I think she did scare away all the competition. There's only six horses uh, in, in this yeah. race, uh, the Philly and Mare Sprint. Um, Bella Sophia, you know, she was, she'll probably be second favorite. Uh, she's got a nice win streak going. Uh, Edgeway, you know, she's California based. Uh, she won her last and her best distance is seven eighths, but uh, I'm with Jason. I, I don't know how, <laughs> I think the only way you, you beat her is lock her up in the stall back in the back stretch. but uh, Gamine looks uh, pretty impressive. Well, you did mention Bella Sophia, only three year old in the race. N uh, quite a good story there, purchased for $20,000. Hmm? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Not, Compared not, to not the 1.8 million right? of Gamine, right? doesn't right. happen often right no it doesn't but it, it's nice to see those stories once in a while i mean you know you you, you don't to get this game started and we're going to talk about a, a game changer a little bit later on but to get this to get started this game you sometimes you get lucky you know that twenty thousand dollar purchase turns into somebody like bella sophia so let's move on to the turf sprint five furlongs glass slippers the defending champ race three times this year finished third each time has drawn the rail so Golden Pal, likely favorite, uh, one of three horses trained by Wesley Ward. Golden Pal won the Juvenile Turf Sprint last year, uh, won the Woodward Stakes this year. Uh, what are your thoughts about, about this race? Yeah, I think uh, I'm going with Slipper. I mean, yes, Wesley Ward uh, always has to be respected in terms of sprints, especially with the babies, but uh, I'm going with Slipper for – I don't think it would be that big of a surprise. It would be just kind of a, a lukewarm surprise, Joe right the uh case of you adrian mcginnis won the group uh, uh, the uh gr group one de la bay in longchamp uh emeradiana won the group one betfair sprint cup uh lieutenant dan which i love the name love the lieutenant dan uh yeah you know, back in the day buddies, uh, yeah 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 uh starts from the four hole extravagant kid was second last year some other i guess some horses to consider um Okay, the sprint, six furlongs in the dirt. Jackie's Warrior won the Alan Jenkins Memorial Stakes. Uh, no, just a nose ahead of life is good. Uh, 
you know, Jackie's Warrior has four wins in his last five stakes races. So that's it's a horse you might want to consider at six furlongs in the sprint. Uh, here's another Japanese horse you're looking at, uh, Matera Sky, seven year old. Uh, he's been in the top two 16 times in 35 career races. So Matera Sky from Japan is, is another uh, horse to consider. And of course, Ferenc Fire. This is, will be Friends Fire's final race, a 13-time winner. Yeah. So there's sentimental value, I suppose, here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Jackie's Warrior has the target on his back. I mean, geez, the horse, he's solid. He's solid. I mean, do you take a three-year-old against older? Obviously, we're past the point now worrying about that. I think it's okay to, to tackle a you know older bunch when you're a three-year-old. And, you know, he's just a cool, cool dude. I'm going to try to beat him just because I think there's value elsewhere. I'm going to go to the outside and Dr. Chevelle. And Dr. Chevelle comes in hot, riding a five-race win streak. He's been at Del Mar. He doesn't have to ship. He's already West Coast based. So that, to me, is worth at least noting. I know some horses handle shipping better than others. And I love the versatility that Pratt's going to have with this guy, Joe, because, you know, he can race up front or he can, you know, Races off the pace like he did more recently in that, uh, I guess say the Bing Crosby, he was able to win off the pace last time he was sprinting up front. So, yeah, I think he he draws beautifully outside. He's going to offer a nice little mid-range price, maybe five to one. I'll go, I'll go Dr. Chevelle. All right. Sandy, well, I wanted to ask you about that, uh, what, what, the shipping end thing. Uh, do you find that uh, there is a home, home, home course advantage? Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, when horses have to ship in, it's got to take a little bit out of them, Joe, and then they have to quarantine. So uh, definitely takes uh, something out of the horse. But, you know, they, they proved us wrong so many times that, uh, you know, they, they can make it make it through all that and uh, and still run their best race. But, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd rather have a horse that's already on the grounds than having a horse ship in for sure. Billy Mare Turf, a mile and three eighths. Warlike Goddess, Bill Mott trained, four race win streak, captured the Flower Bowl Stakes at Saratoga back on September 4th, not that long ago. $600,000 great one, uh, great one uh, race. Uh, very patient ride in this one. That was the key. Uh, June Leperu has been solid with her, right? And again, she comes in hot. She deserves some respect. I think the waters get significantly deeper, though, on the weekend, Joe. I mean, yes, this was a big win in the grade one flower bowl, and she proves she can run all day long because this race you're watching here is 11 furlongs, so you can tell by the riders' body language this is not money time. This is just the first time passing the line, and yeah, she settles in nicely, and, and that's exactly what you want, and Sandy can attest to this. You don't want to be fighting the jockey because it's a, it's a lose-lose negative energy. No. You're, you know, you're, you know, like I agree, Sandy, that's not a good. Yeah, you know what? You're right, man. You know, especially going going a mile and three eighths, you have to have a horse that's in behind, kind of relaxed. You know, if you're in front and your horse is relaxed, that's okay. But if your horse is dragging you around there, as a rider, sometimes you get halfway around there and you go, "Oh, I'm dead. <laughs> I don't have a chance now." You definitely need a horse that's uh, nice and relaxed. Uh, War like goddess looks like uh, she could be really, really tough in here. Of course, Bill Mott fantastic trainer too and uh, the horse love that's uh, going to be running in this race as well you know second last time out carrying 137 pounds a european horse uh it's won some grade ones could be tough as well sandy what about the uh, you know when you're riding a patient race like that you know you've got a little bit of horse uh, uh are you sitting even though you're sitting backwards are you are you feeling pretty confident at this stage even though it looks like you're well back Oh yeah, you know what you want. You want to wait as long as you can, but you kind of, you know, people say you know jockeys have a clock in their head. Well, it's it's just a, a sense of feeling of how fast the pace is up front, how much horse you have left, and you know just the right time to make your move. And <laughs> Warlike Goddess looks pretty awesome in here. Yeah, uh, yeah the way she move. picks it up right at this point. Yeah, no, she. So yeah, the waters get deeper. Just for, in my opinion, from a European standpoint obviously she's tackled the best on uh you know our side of the 49 our side of the um the atlantic i should say and she's been really good so i'm not trying to knock her obviously she's a solid fit i'm just gonna go in a different direction i like rougier coming in off that victory the uh, pre de l'opera longin 
I, I really feel like she's been knocking on the door. She kicked it down last time. Finally, it's going to give her some confidence. I'm going to go to the four horse at six to one. But, you know, Sandy brought up a great point. It's not about how fast you're going. It's how you're going fast. Two completely different things, right? So if a horse is going 22.45 and they're doing it easily, time means nothing, right? They're going 22.45 and you're asking them, well, then that's completely different. So that's why I always like to say it's not how fast you're going. It's how you're going fast. A race has been dominated by the Europeans and uh, best shot probably from the North American side, Warlike Goddess. But again, you mentioned, I think you brought up earlier, Sandy, love, loves only you, that Japanese horse. Uh, won a grade one yeah. recently in Hong yeah. Kong. Top uh, top three and all all the all the starts this year so far for yeah. for her and uh, you know something to consider. Okay, moving on to the the mile turf. Uh, yeah. Mo Forza only two races, won them both on the Del Mar turf, trained by Peter Miller, ridden by Flavian Pratt, uh, Master of the Seas, runner up in the two thousand guineas, Mother Earth, runner up in last year's uh, Breeders' Cup Juveniles Phillies turf. Uh, got Stormy, trained by Woodbine regular Mark Cassie. Cassie's won this race before. Uh, any thoughts about the uh, about the uh, turf, the mile turf? Uh, I'll say this. Uh, you know what? Big fan of Got Stormy. And she battles hard all the time. And and I realize this is a tough spot. It, it should be right. It's it's the Breeders' Cup. It's the biggest stage we have in terms of racing. And yeah, I, I'm just she's just kind of the sentimental pick for me. But I mean. Contention, as you would expect, runs deep. You can go in several different directions in this race. Yeah, I love God Stormy, too. Like Jason said, uh, runs hard every single time. And you got to cheer for Mark Cassie. Mark Cassie such a great guy. Uh, just inducted into the uh, U.S. Hall of Fame. Of course, already in the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame. But the U.S. Horse Racing Hall of Fame now, very well deserving. Uh, you got to be cheering for him. Boy, he's good. <laughs> he's good, eh? <laughs> Uh, the distaff, a mile and an eighth on the dirt. Latruska, one of these dominating horses. Uh, 17 wins and 22 starts, five race win streak, four of them grade ones. Hasn't trailed in five straight races. The last, most recently, wire to wire at the Judmont Spinster Stakes, October 10th at Keeneland. Uh, you know, let the challengers get within a length or so, maybe a length and a half, and then it was bye bye. Uh, Mexican horse. <laughs> That just loves going wire, wire to wire. Uh, Irad Ortiz Jr. rides, you know, and he has not, or Latruska has not lost with uh, Irad Ortiz Jr. aboard. Uh, Fausto Gutierrez says, this is a one of a kind, a life changing horse. And that's the one I wanted to talk about. Uh, have you guys seen lives changed by, by a horse like this? 100%. One hundred percent, Joe. I mean, we're all just one horse away from being, you know, in that spotlight. And Sandy, you, you know, you can talk about this. I mean, look at Eureka da Silva, multiple champion jockey here in Canada. Uh, he got here. He couldn't even buy a mount, literally. So he went out and bought his own horse just so he can get a ride, right? So you need to be able to prove yourself. You get that one horse to put you on the map. Whether it's as a rider, a trainer, an owner, that's all you need. And then you can springboard from there. So, yeah, I mean, Latruska is a really cool story. And she likes to be up front. I think she gets some more pressure coming up on Sunday. And if she does, I think she could be vulnerable. But, yeah, Sandy, for sure, you're, we're all just one horse away, right? Well, you know what? The, you, you hit the nail on the head because I remember when I started riding in California, things weren't going that well. And I picked up a filly called Susan's Girl in, in one of the stake races. She won. And then after I won that race, I, I started picking up other mounts. And uh, all of a sudden, Bobby Frankel starts riding me. Uh, Mike Mitchell, Gary Jones. So, yeah, one horse can do it for you. Uh, the Truska, boy, does she look impressive. And I think she's one of the favorites for a horse of the year as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, she she's solid. I mean, what is it, five in a row now that she's won? I can't even keep up with her. But... Um... In true Porty style, I'm trying to find a bit of a edge. And I think Malafat, a little bothered by the fact we haven't seen her in forever. You have to go all the way back to the Alabama. That was at Saratoga towards the end of August. But it's Todd Pletcher. And um, she was able to win first time out, so she can fire fresh. She is one head away from being a perfect 7 for 7. I think Malafat kind of just lurks in the weeds, guys, and has a chance to pull off the upset. Well, she won. She won yep. the Kentucky Oaks. 
I think yep. she won the Kentucky Open. So and she'll be she'll be coming from off the pace. Uh, she'll she'll be she'll be making her move. Should be an interesting race, which they all are. <laughs> yeah. Right. Of course. They, they they how often do they turn out exactly the way you expect them to? Horologist exactly. uh, trained by Bill Mott, and he's won the Distaff five times. So, you know, uh, any, okay. anything 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 that any horse that Bill Mott puts a saddle on, you have to consider, you know, if it's a Bill Mott trained horse, it's got and a the, shot. And Marshall Lorraine, uh, another Japanese horse. I was just going to say that. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth, yeah. Joe. And uh, you know, she's coming in, and she'll love the distance. I, I heard she'll love the distance, so she could be another one that uh, I think she has. Um, she got the uh, one of the outside posts, the ten post or something. Ten, but uh, yeah, ten. Yeah, she'll be yeah. Tough. She'll be tough for sure. Be cheering for her as well. Right, All three right. wins this year. Okay, onto the turf, mile and a half. Uh, Tarnawa, Dermot, well trained. Uh, won the Breeders' Cup turf last year at seventy to one. Aga Khan horse. Um, yeah. Then uh, Love, trained by Aiden O'Brien, who has won this race six times. You know, that's not too bad. Uh, uh, did she, Channel, America, Channel Maker is an Ontario bred. Didn't draw in, I believe, but it's also eligible, trained by Bill Mott. Seven-year-old gelding, $3.3 million, was third in the race last year, but I don't believe Channel Maker is going to draw in, it looks like. What are your thoughts on, uh, on the, on the uh, mile and a half? I'm going to go Walton Street. We spoke of horses, you know, using Woodbine as, you know, a stepping stone to get to the uh, the ultimate prize. And I really feel like this horse, he looked the part. He just, I don't think he even blew out a candle after the race. He wasn't breathing hard enough to blow out a candle. So I'm going to uh, go with that horse. I think he's got a big time shot. It's tough for me, though, because I also like Gufo. I'm a huge fan of Gufo, and Gufo is also in this race. So... You get down to the actual race day and post time. Sometimes I'm going to just look at the odds and whoever maybe offers a better number, I'll, I'll go in that one's direction. But yeah, Walton Street off of that romping win with Frankie DeTore. Now I know Jack Duell is going to step aboard, but off that big win in the international, I think he's got a chance to just um, prove it was no fluke. Right now. Okay, let's move on to the big race. All right. The Breeders' Cup Classic, a mile and a quarter, classic distance, $6 million the purse. And uh, yeah. we're going to start, the horse we're going to start looking at here, uh, Essential Quality, eight wins and nine starts, a uh, superstar horse, another horse with uh, uh, horse of the year potential. There's a couple of them in this field. We'll get to them all. Uh, last year's Equi Eclipse Award winner's champion, two-year-old male. Uh, he won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile last year. Uh, he had a tough trip in the Derby. Brad Cox, the trainer, he won the three graded stakes races this year, including the Belmont. And the 156th edition of the Traverse Stakes right here, August 28th at Saratoga. Great battle at the finish with Midnight Bourbon. Luis Saez is the jockey. Your thoughts about essential quality? Well, I always try to beat him, <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, stupid on my part. His only loss was in the Derby by a length. <laughs> but we never had a great there. You know, he got bumped at the start. He was very wide, so... All things considered, yeah, no, he is a solid, solid racehorse. And Luis Saez, hey, he had a bit of a tough decision here because he's been riding Art Collector for Bruce Lunsford, a guy who owns a bunch of horses that race at Woodbine with Barb Mitchell. And Saez opted for essential quality. I think you got to go with the gray. He's a little bit more accomplished, obviously, than Art Collector is. And, man, the contention runs deep. This might be the best classic ever. I've been around to see all of them, but this just wow. might be the best this think, is going to oh yeah it's going to be a tremendous race uh i mean uh, like jason said it could be the best uh classic ever it's a tremendous tremendous race essential quality you know he finished third in the derby but uh as you mentioned he did have a bad trip he came when he won the belmont the jim dandy and his latest the traverse stakes he just uh he looks really really impressive uh you know, he's eight for nine, and as you mentioned, the only race he got beat was, was in the Kentucky Derby. It's going to be a fantastic race, which it always is. Good battle here with Midnight Bourbon. Uh, and did, is this horse, is the, the gray here, we, we see essential quality. Does this horse give you, show you championship pedigree in this battle right here? Oh, yeah. You know what? As, as a rider, you love to ride a horse like this. You know, he just... Uh, you know, you, he doesn't win by very far, but he, he wins every time. 
I mean, he has that competition beside him, and he, he just uh, puts the competition away. And as a rider, you love riding a horse like this. He makes you look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does, doesn't he? They can make you look good and make you look bad at the same time, right? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> make you look well, bad, but well, uh, but eight times so out Brad of nine, Cox, well, made you look good. <laughs> so Brad Cox also saddles a horse called Nick's Go. He won the Breeders' Cup yeah. mile last year. Might well, you know, he, he could be the favorite. It could be what it could be essential quality. It could be next go. Uh, this year, he won the Pegasus World Cup Invitational and two other stakes races, including this one right here, the Whitney Stakes in Saratoga in August. Uh, Joel Rosario bore, dominant aboard this uh, this horse right here. It's a small field, uh, but he is six for six going two turns, and the, the buyer number in this race very impressive, one hundred and eleven. Nick's go. Yeah. Nick's go. Yeah, he go. Oh, yeah. Man, oh, man. Talk about the perfect one-two punch for Brad Cox, right? So you got the speed of Nick's go, the closing power of essential quality, who likes to stalk. So yeah, he's got a full hand. And it was a bit of tongue-in-cheek when I was talking about the, the Breeders' Cup Classic and said that I haven't been able to see them all because usually that's something you say because it goes back into the early 1900s or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. Obviously, with starting in the late 80s, I've watched them all, Joe, and yeah, this this race has a bit of everything. And, and it'd be very – I don't know if it's ever happened. I'm sure potentially it has. But to have a horse win the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, which is considered a sprint, and then come back – and then the next year, when going a mile and a quarter in the Classic, I don't think that's ever been done. Maybe it has, but it's just very rare to get a sprint-heavy horse to then stretch out and go a distance of 12 furlongs like this, Sandy. Uh, you know what, furlongs. for sure. And you know what? This yeah. this race, uh, it could actually decide who's going to be horse of the year, which it has in the past. But uh, next right. go, what a tremendous horse. What a, what a fantastic race this is going to be. As you say, Brad Cox, he's, he's got a horse that's going to come flying off the pace and a horse that's going to probably set the pace in Nick's go. I mean, he's he's never been a mile and a quarter before, but everything he does, and every distance he's went, he's been very, very impressive. You can see, you know, he he just he's pulling away again. I mean, yeah, he yeah. just makes it look so easy. And ridden, pulling away. It's, it's, it is pretty easy. Uh, the Couple other horse you want to consider... There. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Another another horse we want to consider, uh, we're going to consider, of course, the Kentucky Derby winner, Medina Spirit, third in the Preakness, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Baffert train. Uh, late August, uh, Medina Spirit won the uh, Shared Belief Stakes, also won the Awesome Again Stakes, uh, grade one at Santa Anita right here, a mile and one eighth. Uh, and he was awesome in that one. He would pull away down the stretch to win it going away with uh, John Velasquez, Velasquez dry, uh, riding. Uh, Medina Spirit is trying to become the fifth horse to win the Derby and the Classic in the same calendar year. Uh, Medina Spirit, of course, we had the controversy. Baffert was suspended from Churchill Downs after Medina Spirit tested positive for an overage, uh, sorry, an overage of betamethasone. Betamethasone. Uh, it's illegal, anti-inflammatory, uh, and that horse tested, uh, had too much of the uh, betamethasone in its system after the Derby. What are your thoughts on on first of all medina spirit and uh and uh the uh the the situation with uh baffert jason let's start with you all right well medina spirit the horse yeah i mean it's hard to knock a guy like this i mean we all know about the blemish in terms of the kentucky derby that's gonna take a while to get figured out but you know, he just loves a good old-fashioned fist fight. You see his ears are pricked. Sandy can tell you any time a horse will give you their ears like that, that's a good thing because they're not trying fully as of yet. So you love to look over between their ears and see that they're pricked, and you're like, oh, yeah, we, we got some gas and some giddy-up left in the, in the tank here. Now, in terms of Baffert, okay, I get it. He doesn't have the squeaky, cleanest path past, but... Um, you know what? I think it would really help racing if we all got on the same page because there's always different medication requirements and levels allowed depending on the jurisdiction, whether you're racing in New York, whether you're racing in California, right. whether you're racing uh, all over the place, right? I mean, Kentucky. So I think, although, yes, I, I understand, you know, Baffert did wrong and is being penalized for it. I just wish we had one governing body that overlooked all 
of racing, even in North America, so to speak. That way, you don't have to think as a trainer, how much of this can I give to a horse? How much of that can I do? Even for riders, here at Woodbine, we got to hit underhand, and we got a three-strike rule. One, two, three, then you got to ride again. You cross the border to Florida, you can do whatever you want. You hit overhand, underhand, as many times as you want. So there's just too much going on. I just wish we could get on the same playing field in terms of medication for the trainers so they know what's going on for the horses. You know, some use Lasix, some don't use Lasix. And riders, you know, what can you do, what can't you do? So anyways, that's that's my little rant. Sandy, I'll, I'll def defer right. to you now. That's good. I like it. Sandy? Sandy? Well, I think, I think Jason said it all, but, uh, you know, just to add that, uh, you know, you hate to see any horse disqualified, especially in the Kentucky Derby. Um, I'm happy to see that Bob Baffert's allowed to run his horses uh, in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, you know, it's very unfortunate what happened. I'm sure it wasn't done on purpose. Uh, I'm sure it was, it was an accident, but, uh, you know, it's very unfortunate uh, that things like this have to happen. And like Jason said, if there was one... Uh, uh, boarding government that that would be uh that'd be great but uh you know getting back to medina spirit i'll tell you what if, if he gets on an easy lead he could he could be really tough to beat i mean he's he's probably going to set the pace um you know he's uh probably going to go off at about uh, four to one or so and like i said he he could go wire to wire just like he did in his last race well, what a great group of horses. And we haven't even touched on Hot Rod Charlie when the Pennsylvania Derby. That's my pick. Gate to wire. Is that your pick, Jay? Yeah, $2.2 yeah, $2 million, I mean, Hot Rod Charlie. Yeah. He, he, was yeah my I mean, pick the derby. he was my pick in the Derby, Jason. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Well, you, really make like your money it. back now, Sandy. Make your money back now because <laughs> I can <laughs> okay. see Nick's go. I don't, I don't know if anybody's fast enough to go with Nick's go because, you know, he is a one-trick pony. He has to have the lead to win. If he doesn't get the lead, we've seen it before, he just doesn't play. So Joel Rosario has no option. He's got to send and send hard. So if anybody else wants to run with him and ch chances are probably ruin their own little um, opportunity at winning, then they might do that. But I'm hoping that somebody goes with Nick and I there's a strong chance it'll be Medina Spirit. And if that's the case, even Art Collector... I don't know if he's quick enough. Hot Rod Charlie, even though the blinkers are going on, which suggests injecting more pace, I think he can sit just off of it with Pratt. And I think he's a little bit of a, you know, little upset minded proposition at four to one. Joy, I, I think Jason, pounds. I think Jason's yeah. got a good point. You know what? This could be uh it could be Hot Rod Charlie's race, you know, with the way the speed is in here, it could set it up perfectly for him and, and he'll be coming on, on coming on end. Should be a, a fantastic race as usual. So we're going to get the horse of the year out of this race, do you think? Unless there's an upset, of course. If somebody comes along, like say Art Collector, or you know, some comes along with wins yeah. race, and maybe, maybe you, maybe you get you know, horse race coming from like Gamine or Latruska or uh, another yeah. race. But uh, if Latruska I, wins, I uh, that, it's impressively, it could be uh, could make it really interesting for horse of the year for sure. Yeah, no, it, I know it, it never... could, Sandy's right. Yeah, it could. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, though, the classic carries a lot of weight, right? It's sort of, it's sort of mm -hmm. like the three-year-olds here in, in Canada, right? You win the Oaks, you, gotta... you win the plate. It doesn't make you a slam dunk, but it pretty much gives you a leg up on the competition, right? For sure, for sure. Very rarely does the Queen's Plate winner not win course of the year in Canada. Um, so now, if you're, if you're talking about, well, it happens. It does happen, actually. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, I know there's never a lock in racing, never lead pipe sink. Right. But if there's a, if you could take a horse in all these races that we 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 uh, looked at today, is there one that sticks out to you and say, well, this is probably the closest thing we got to a lock? Uh I I guess Gamine, even though the price won't be there. Uh, I mean, it's a small field. She's only got five rivals, and yeah, odds on. I I think I'm playing some. Horizontal wagers, I'm going to um, use that as a key horse and then just kind of spread in some other legs. But uh, for me, I, I think, I mean, I mean, as much as we talked about, you know, as a three-year-old in Canada, you know, winning the Plate Noakes makes you the slam dunk winner for sophomore of the year. I, I think that is as close as we get to a slam dunk. I mean, there shouldn't be one because it's the Breeders' Cup, but I think it means in a league of her own. Right. Sandy? All right, I was, I was going to say, Jason, what about Jack Christopher in the TVG Juvenile? I mean, yep. he's two for two. Okay. He, 
Oh man, he he just looked like looks like every time he wins, he wins under wraps. I know he's only had two starts, but uh, yeah, he, he could be uh, one of the biggest locks as well. Yeah, for me, it's like it's Gamine or Latruska. Either of those horses could be uh, could be dominant. But if there was a if there was any lock, yeah, I, I would have to go with Gamine. Okay, guys, before I let you go, I just want to get your thoughts on on the on the local hockey team, uh, uh, the Maple Leafs. They they saw they locked up Morgan Riley for uh, eight years and, and sixty million dollars, and uh, they won a couple of games now. What are your thoughts? What are you thinking, Sandy? I know you're living. Well, I've been a Toronto Maple Leafs fan since Punch Imlac. <laughs> uh, wow. Coached the hockey team. I was just a little kid, Jason. Come on. I, yeah. My dad, my dad was a big Maple Leafs hockey fan. You know, my, my two boys now, Bradley and Russell, they're big Leafs fans as well, probably because of me. But uh, I, I think they probably would have been anyways, a home team. Uh, you know, it's great to see them uh, sign, uh, get Riley signed. I, I think that was one of the main things they had to get done this year. Uh, you know, he, I, I think he, uh, he's a fantastic player. One of the best defensemen in the league I always was. And, uh, you know, he's, I think he's the, the longest playing leaf right now uh, on their team. So it's mm -hmm. great to see them yep. get him signed. And, you know, I'll always be a leaf fan, no matter what, uh, Jason, how about yeah. your Boston Bruins or the Toronto Maple Leafs? <laughs> <laughs> My Bruins are off to a slow start. We, we, we got a long way to go, but you know what? It's the market. I know some people will say oh, that's a lot of money for Morgan Riley, who isn't exactly a Norris Award winning defenseman, right? So I get it, though, because if you don't give it to him, somebody else will. It's that type of a situation right now as a GM in the NHL. He's a good puck moving blue liner. I do like that. I kind of liken him to Tory Krug, who used to play with Boston and, and now since has moved on. I do believe the Blues, if I'm not mistaken. We still have a, a Matt Grizzly, right. who's that, that same type. So it's funny, guys, because back in the day, the Norris Award winner would be for, you know, your defensive play, you know, your blocking shots, your killing penalties, stuff like that. Not anymore. Every year, whoever wins the Norris, it's the most offensive defenseman, right? You got to be like a Paul Coffey, right? Um, mm hmm uh, Brian Leach. They, they like those offensive Shea Weber, those offensive defensemen. So I do like Morgan Riley a lot, but the bottom line is this for Leaf fans. Got to get Mitch Marner going when it counts in the playoffs until he gets going. They're not going anywhere. And even Matthews, right? Those two are the ones that make that team tick. You got that right. It, 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 all, all that matters is the playoffs now. I mean, we it, yeah. it, a lot of broken hearts last uh, last spring. I mean, it, it oh. was kind of like the worst of the worst when 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 they went out in the first round against the Habs. You know, there there'd be disappointment before, but that was that was rock bottom, and they really need to do something uh, this year. There's gonna be a lot of lot of changing, a lot of changes. Yeah, well, Joe, that was their easiest easiest path. Easy, easy for me to say. That was the easiest yeah. path to get to the Stanley Cup because all you had to do was win that Canadian division and right away you're in the semifinals, right? So that uh, that doesn't bode well for the team. But yeah. even though I'm a Bruins fan, I do reside in the GTA. So I got on my Leafs underwear, guys. I got on my Leafs underwear. Right. There you go. All right. Good to hear. Well, yeah, well, the there's, there's, were also, yeah. there's also, Joe, there's so many other teams that are coming up too. Like Ottawa's yeah. playing better. Detroit's playing better. First of all, you got to make the playoffs. Like Boston and Toronto, they they both have to start picking it up. You right. got to make the playoffs. Yeah, yeah they had, they did. The both teams have struggled early, but I, I I've got a feeling the Leafs picked it up a notch. They've won a couple of games now. Marner's playing better. Matthews, of course, he was injured the first few games. It takes him a little while to find his stride for sure. But as you mentioned last year, the stars were lined. Everything was going to work out fine until Tavares took the, got got injured, and that changed everything. That's my, my estimation. Well, like, anyway. like my agent used to always say, Joe, the cream always comes to the top. And I think when it's all said and done, I think the Leafs and the Bruins will be in the playoffs. They might even meet up again in the playoffs. So that would be very interesting. Would be awesome. It'd be a better yeah. Leafs team and maybe not quite as good a Bruins team. Let's hope, let, let's hope for that, eh, Ray J? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> all right. Well, time will tell. Listen, guys, thank you so much for being on the show today. This is awesome. I love doing this. Uh, of course, we got some great clothing for you from uh, Jeff over at Classic Imports. I know you know him well, Jason. Uh, he's yep. going to take care of you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, all right. Good good to have you guys here. Sandy, you're, you're a Canadian sports legend. It's always awesome to have you on the show. And uh, thank you, Joe. Get your insight when, when it comes to racing. And, uh, guys, oh, remember –
we're all in it together. That's right. Always great to see you guys. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, guys. You too. Hey. All right. Hey, I'm Canadian rocker Tommy Gunn, and you got more Joe Tilly Sports coming up. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. Excuse me. Have you heard of the new Divot app? There's a Divot app? No, but there is a Divot. And we're going to have to do something about that. It's simple. Just pick up the Divot and replace it. All sorted. Have a good round. When I'm working out, I like to wear my Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show t-shirt. It makes me feel handsome and strong. If you want a t-shirt, support the show, click on the link below. Now, back to my workout. 1,761, 1,762, 1,763, 1,764. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center. Saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by COSA, Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at cosaonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing, year-round. Go to hpibet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today, and your first bet is free. That's hpibet.com. All right, time now for my COSA Swiss Picks of the Week. Last week, we went to the Meadowlands for the two-year-old Colton Getting Gelding Pace Final for the Breeders' Cup. And guess what? First was... Not first. Uh, I took Beach Glass and the two-year-old Colton Gelding Pace. He was right there with Monty Mickey's. They headed to the top of the stretch. Unfortunately... It took a lot on the beach glass to get there. He faded while Monty Mickey held off a late challenge from Gulf Shores. The favorite, Pebble Beach, got up for third. There were some upsets as Felicity Shagwell knocked off Atlanta in the mare trot. Ocean Rock pulled off the stunner at 16-1 to 1 in the open pace at the Breeders' Crown. And te uh, Test of Faith came through as the favorite in the Philly pace. All in all, a great weekend of racing in the Meadowlands for the Breeders' Crown extravaganza. This week, okay, we're going to go back to Mohawk for the final of the Harvest Series for two-year-old pacing Colts and Gelding. We're going to go as sports advisor, of, co uh, of course, sports advisor, for driver Doug McNair and Rick Zeron, stables. Uh, sports advisor was extremely impressive in last week's second leg, winning his heat easily in 153-1. and one. After the smoke clears, my bankroll is now at $88. Go to COSA online, Instagram, Twitter, COSA TV, uh, Facebook, Central Ontario Standard Association. For all your racing updates, visit COSA TV on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options.
Well, a great job by the Leafs to get Morgan Riley signed to that eight-year, $60 million deal. Uh, he wanted to stay. The Buds wanted to keep him. It uh, worked out for good for both sides. Good market value. They'll deal with the cap issues later. Riley would have got a lot more money if he had gone to the open market. Jake Muzzin is the first Leafs defender to get a goal this season. John Tavares had a goal and a couple of helpers as the Buds bounced the Red Wings to get back to 500 for the first time. Former wing Peter Morazic got his first win as a Leaf. The first in a five-game homestand for Toronto. Well, what a great pick. Scotty Barnes is turning out to be for the Raptors. The number four overall selection is having some kind of start to his career, averaging 20 points and 10 boards. He had 21 and 12 at Indiana as the Donnas rung up their third straight win. Scotty is something else, folks. Then Barnes had the night off, and they still rallied from 15 down against the Knicks. One of the best teams in the conference. Barnes with a thumb issue, but he should be okay. Should be back for the next game. 36 points in that last game for OG Ananobi. Wow. The Raptors have now rung up four straight wins and definitely looking like a contender here, folks. Hey, the Argos are back in the playoffs. How about that? The boat fellows needed overtime to get past the BC Lions. The Lions had a chance to win the game and put it on ice, but Jimmy Camacho missed a potential game-winning field goal, and he had another one blocked. Solid work by the Toronto special teams. McLeod Bethel Thompson had a, a, had a great game. He ran for a touchdown in overtime. Then they got the two-point convert. That was a difference in as the game as the Argos won a thriller 31-29 to take over first place in the East. All to themselves at 7-4. and four. Montreal and Hamilton are tied for second at 6-5. and five, And the Argos have clinched a playoff spot. Taylor Pendrith came close, but he'll have to wait for that first PGA title. The 30-year-old from Richmond Hill had the third-round lead at the Butterfield Bermuda Championship. He slipped down to fifth in the final round with a five-over score. But you know what? He's going to benefit from that experience. Way to go, Taylor. Taylor Pendrith will be back. Mary Spence is off to a solid 2-0 start as a pro in her pro boxing career. The former world amateur champ who hails from Wyerton improved to 2-0 with an easy win over Luis Mondaca in Mexico. Spence can fight, folks. She's going to be great. And Canada knocked off France in the opening round of the Billie Jean King Cup. Francoise Abanda won her singles match while Rebecca Marino and Gabrielle Dabrowski won in doubles. Hockey helps the homeless. That is your chance to play with the pros for a great cause and our charity of choice. Enter your team today or enter as an individual at HockeyHelpsTheHomeless.com. Suit up, skate, and score with some all-time NHL greats in various locations across the country. Feed the hungry, help them get back on their feet, and help keep young folks off the street. 14 tournaments nationwide, had the Waterloo region last week, uh, Calgary this weekend, then it's York, Halifax, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Peel, Barrie, Saskatoon, Montreal, Durham region, Bay Street, Edmonton, and London. The event has helped raise $2.5 million for those who really need it. HockeyHelpsTheHomeless.com And we close with a look at the folks who make this show possible. These are friends trusted business associates, and all-around great people. I highly recommend them all. A reminder that the show is now also available on Spotify, iTunes, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcast, and Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network and Zingo TV. And like and subscribe to the show on YouTube. Thanks once again to Sandy Hawley and Jason Portwando for joining us for a Breeders' Cup preview. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week when Dan Robson, a wonderful author, Drops by. We'll see you then. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show is brought to you by Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. And let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family and your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did 905-686-5678. Brought to you by MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business consulting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the needs of our clients in the private, public, and non-for-profit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to doing business 
and personalized strategies to help people and organizations succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Toronto, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, our team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca to learn more. You know, if I'm going to a public place or visiting a friend, I like to be safe and stylish. That's why I put on my Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show mask. Come on in. If you want to support the show, pick up a mask, click on the link below. That was good, eh? What did you think? You really liked it? Yeah, it seemed to fly by, eh? Good job with all that video. Jeez.